Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dreas Rattery. I am one of the hosts for the 2022 Youth Climate Summit. We are so excited to have you all here, and it is my privilege and pleasure to be here with you all. Again, this is an event, uh, the purpose of which is to create space for our island's youth to learn about climate change, the impacts it has, and the role that they can play, that you all can play in addressing the impacts of climate change in Bermuda. Uh, it is also my pleasure to introduce uh, the uh, co-host. I'm co-hosting this event with Noelle Young. Noelle is the Administrative Coordinator of BOP, the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity Program, seeking to protect over 20% of Bermuda's waters. Uh, Noelle has been pursuing her education uh, in environmental science and her, it has taken her on an adventure all over the world. She has learned about specifically about fish and aquaculture um, in more places than I could uh, possibly remember. And she's been on a, a really cool journey and is now um, back in Bermuda um, where she is tackling uh, a lot of a lot of very important work uh, with the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity Program. Noelle? Hi everyone, good afternoon. I hope you're all just as excited to be here as I am. Um, thank you for the awesome introduction, Andreas. I'd like to do yours. Uh, so good afternoon, guys. I would like to introduce your primary host for today, Andreas Rattery. Andreas is a born and bred Bermudian environmental scientist who is just as fired up about the environment as he is about music. Bermuda's surrounding ocean has blessed Andreas with an amazing understanding of who he is and he is committed to helping other people establish this same fantastic connection with the environment that surround them. Dreas has a desire for everyone on this earth to feel competent and confident when they head outdoors. He loves to practice and teach science and is, and is inspired through his ongoing research, educational and educational work to bring the community into environmental science through mentorship, community outreach and personal development. Please feel free to check out his bio. The link is in the chat. Welcome back, Dreas. We are so happy to have you for the 2022 BUEI Youth Climate Summit. Thank you very much, Noelle. So Noelle and I are going to be your uh, liaisons between yourselves and the presenters. We've got wonderful presenters from youth activists to subject matter experts and some alumni. So students who participated in the Climate Summit last year will be returning. And one of the best ways for you to ask uh, questions or give commentary to the presenters is through us. So throughout the event, uh, we want this to be an interactive event. Everyone will be muted uh, just so that we're not all talking at once. Uh, but if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat and we will ensure that uh, those comments and questions are given to, um, to the presenters. Um, so there will also be polls, and that is a, another opportunity uh, for you to, um, again, to participate in this event. While it is virtual, we want it to be as uh, interactive as possible. Uh, before we get into anything else, definitely want to uh, give a massive thank you to our partners for supporting this event. So that is AXA XL and HSBC. Thank you again uh, for making this event possible. So a quick overview. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about what climate change is, uh, Climate 101, if you will. Um, tomorrow, we'll be talking about the impacts of climate change and why you should care about them, the, the impacts that they have uh, here in Bermuda. Uh, on Wednesday, we'll be talking about what can we do. So after having learned about all of the different challenges, we'll learn about uh, what steps we can actually take uh, to address them. And on Thursday, the final virtual day of the summit, uh, we'll be discussing uh, future projections. So how the future is going to look based on the different decisions uh, that we make uh, as a community. Um, and this will all culminate um, with an in-person event uh, at BUEI at the end of the week. Um, so with that being said, just want to do a quick uh, orientation to Zoom. I expect that a lot of people are familiar with uh, Zoom. However, just want to make sure everyone's on the same page because it is the, the uh, platform that we are using uh, for this event. So one thing that I would uh, we can all start by doing now, you should see instructions for how to do this already posted in the chat. But it would be great if everyone could rename yourselves. So if you, um, on the top right-hand corner of the dialog box um, for yourself, uh, your own image, um, if you just hit the three dots, you should be able to rename yourself. And we're going to have everyone use their first name and then the name of the school uh, that you're uh, representing so that we have a way to, when we're um, passing your questions on to the presenters, um, we can uh, be able to reference you and make it a little bit more personal. Um, we also encourage you to use uh, the reactions so um, if you're if something comes up and you, you're you're curious about it or you're excited about it, please please use the uh, the reactions option. It lets us know um, how uh, how this experience is going for you all. Um, 
And yeah, the last thing I'll say on that is just to, if you have any questions on the technical side of things, please check the chat. Um, we have our, our tech support team you already see is consistently posting instructions on how to participate in the event in the chat. So if you have any, uh, any questions, um, the answer might uh, be in the chat. And if not, you can post in the chat and um, that's where we'll find uh, the answer. Uh, so uh, without further ado, we'll actually have you go to your chat uh, right now because we're going to have our opening poll for the event. Um, so that should be, in fact, it's even uh, even easier than that. It's popping, it should be popping up on your screen. Uh, so some questions, we have four different questions for you all. So the first, uh, as we start this summit, how concerned are you about climate issues? So take some time, think about that, and let's get some answers in there. Second question, how confident do you feel that you can discuss climate change with one of your peers? The third question, how confident do you feel that you can discuss climate change with an adult? And the final question being, I believe actions taken in Bermuda can influence climate change here on our island. So it looks like we got about almost half of the participants have contributed answers. Let's see if we can get almost everyone. We want to hear everyone's voices. We're at about 70% participation. Let's see if we can get a few more responses in and then we'll uh, get the results up on the screen. Great, so we have about three quarters of the uh, of responses in, so we'll uh, publish the results of the poll. Great, so we can definitely see that most people are either concerned or very concerned uh, about climate change. So it is an issue that is already on people's minds and people are feeling somewhat confident um, talking about it. So um, that's very cool, especially going off the fact that we had a climate summit last year. It's it's good to see that people are somewhat maintained that, that sort of confidence in, in being able to discuss this. Um, and the overwhelming majority of people do believe the actions taken here in Bermuda can influence climate change. That puts us in a, a great position to welcome our first uh, speaker for this event. We're going to have Scarlett Westbrook. She is a climate activist and journalist from the United Kingdom. Uh, she is the one of the youngest people ever to work in climate and education policy uh, in the United Kingdom. And you can uh, uh, there's a link to her bio so you can uh, learn a little bit more about her, um, which is posted in the chat. Uh, so she is going to give us a, a presentation about how you, you can get involved with climate action, no matter what your what your age is. And she will be in Bermuda um, for a follow up event uh, for anyone who is um, who is a, uh, who is uh, more curious or has any more questions. So with that being said, Scarlett, thank you so much for joining us here. Um, I'll pass the mic over to you. Really excited for your presentation. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Scarlett Westbrook, and I'm an 18-year-old climate activist and journalist uh, from Birmingham, England. I'm one of the youngest policy writers in the world, and I'm most known for being one of the leading organisers of the climate strikes in Europe. I first became involved with climate activism during the 2015 election campaign period in England, canvassing for the Labour Party, which is like the equivalent to the Democrats, um, sharing the message of needing decisive climate action to prospective voters. It was 2014, so it was the year before the Paris Convention, a big climate conference where a lot of decarbonisation targets were set. And I had a homework assignment to read the news where I saw Ed Miliband, who was the current leader of the Labour Party's, calls for enshrining a decarbonisation date into law uh, with a focus on climate and promise for an alternative to the austerity that was all we'd ever known which appealed to me. I did all that I could to try and get him elected. I got tens of voters to care more about the climate and work towards making my elementary school more green, which makes me laugh now, but all of those efforts completely transformed my life. A few years later, in 2018, I became the youngest person in the world to have an A-level in government and politics, which is the exam you sit when you're 18, um, when I was 13. I self-taught the course between the ages of 12 and 13, and I specialised in climate and education policy. I did this alongside my regular year nine studies. So I had to wake up at 4.30 a.m. in the morning to fit revision in um, and did not have a social life for a year. 
So in true overachiever fashion, I didn't stop at studying climate movements. I wanted to set one up too. So a couple of months after I finished my A-level, I joined other young people in England in setting up school climate strikes across the UK, which was a protest movement where students across the country would not attend school on Fridays to raise awareness for the climate crisis and demand action. We were inspired by the Australian school strikes, which had dominated our attention in 2018 autumn, and we were called Fridays for Future internationally, but in the UK we call ourselves UK Student Climate Network. There's a lot that goes into organising a protest that you might not expect. So in England we have to navigate our police system, which is not uh, partial to to protest, um, find stewards, secure first aiders, get permission from the council to use the land to protest on, advertise, make banners and so much more. It's really not a one person job and there's really a role for everyone in it. These strikes completely changed my life. We grew from around 100 people striking in February 2019 um, to 100,000 in London by September of the same year. Our strikes drove the UK government to become the first country to declare a national climate emergency. And it led to politicians inviting me and some other youth strikers to consult on climate policy ahead of the election we had in 2019, which formed a great base for what I went on to do. Um, and the middle picture here is Ed Miliband, who's the like, politician who inspired all of this. So, I entered year 11 of my GCSEs, high school exams, where I had chosen to do all of the climate related subjects like biology, chemistry, physics and geography. But I found that rather than learning about climate, the only time it would be mentioned is when we had to list the benefits. So my friend Joe and I set up a campaign called Teach the Future, a student led campaign to transform the education system to centre it around climate change. School is meant to prepare us for the future, but that's not currently happening. We need to build a resilient society that can deal with the now inevitable impacts of the climate crisis, given we're failing to meet our decarbonisation targets. This means ensuring the next generation of workers, us, have all of the knowledge, skills and resources necessary to deal with the now inevitable effects of the climate crisis. Whether you're a builder or a banker, a farmer or a pharmacist, you're going to be impacted by the climate crisis, so we need to be taught about it in schools. Not to mention the fact that so many new jobs are going to be created that we don't even know about yet. Whether that's PE positions for environmental researchers, people who work on risk management and so much more. To try and make that happen, I wrote a bill called the Climate Education Bill and teamed up with Member of Parliament Nadia Whitam to try and make it law. It's passed its first reading in Parliament and parts of it have already been implemented in the British education system. So climate education is being introduced in elementary schools in the UK for the first time in 2023 and we're beginning to phase out gas spoilers with renewable green energy forts. Great. Uh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scarlett. I just want to give you a heads up that we'll soon be transitioning to questions. Just wanted to give you give you a heads up. OK, thank you. And this is my last slide. Um, advocacy or action. So I think what I do is a mixture of the two. I'm on the ground shouting outside Parliament, but I'm also inside that building writing bills and trying to pass them through. I think they're very interdependent things and you need both to achieve change. I think being an activist and protesting keeps me accountable when I'm in government buildings trying to change the law um, and vice versa. I think that there's a place for everybody and both advocacy and activism are really important and interlinked. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that, Scarlett. So please, uh, to all of our participants watching, hope you uh, that generated some questions for you. We'd love for you to post them in the chat. I'll start off with a few questions of my own, Scarlett. I'm curious about, um, you mentioned that uh, specifically when you're doing activism, it's a lot more work the, than you had thought or that people generally think there's a lot more many more roles um uh, that are required i'm i'm curious how what exact what specific role within that did you take and how how were you able to identify it how were you able to say oh within this broader scheme of activism this is what i'm really good at what allowed you to do that that is a really good question. Um, so because we are all school children and, and I'd finished the high school exams and no one else had because we were like in school at the time, I knew from the get go that my strength would be in figuring out what our asks behind the protest was because I had this knowledge 
of protest of climate policy and that sort of thing so I kind of had my niche in there because I had like educated myself to a level that most people hadn't um, and I also found that I quite enjoy public speaking um, I have a background in acting so I also got to take up more of a like spokesperson role too um, and this was also helped by the fact that I started writing articles for The Independent, which is the biggest newspaper in the UK. So like I had a good um, base in communicating. So those are the two roles that I took on. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm curious as well, that, because you then went on to mention incorporating uh, cl climate literacy into uh, like public education. So at like a s systemic level. I'm curious because it's sort of similar to the first question, it's 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 moving from saying okay what am I good at um just then saying okay what do I need help with or what what could how could other people help I'm curious to know um once you figured out your role uh, what was sort of the process to recruit people to fill in those those other roles um so there's lots of things that we knew we needed so for example I'm so bad at art that I was banned from taking it as a high school subject because my art teacher was like you're never going to learn how to draw um, so I knew we needed people to make posters and banners graphic design that sort of stuff we needed people who had first aid training we needed people who could steward the protest so everyone would be safe so sometimes we had specific call outs on social media or in our local schools and that sort of stuff um, and sometimes we just had generic call outs for everyone and we'd make sure we had trainings for people. So a training I run, two trainings I run on media training and also political education training. So we can make sure everyone has a good base level and then their own specialisms that they can like really hone in on and um, be the best at. Excellent. Thank you. Um, a question from our co-host. Uh, she's really interested in your story and she wants to know. Um, where do you see this? Uh, how do you see this evolving for yourself into the future? So say five years from now, what sort of ideas come to mind when you think about the trajectory that uh, that you're on right now? So our bill has passed the first reading in Parliament, but it's still got a fair bit a fair bit to go. So I think three more readings. So in the next five years, I'd really hope that that would be passed and we'd have completely transformed education system that centers climate. I'm personally doing a medicine degree. Um, so I'll be in five years, I'd be just about to graduate or a year from graduating. So I hope I also look more into the links between health and climate change um, mm -hmm. and get to do some policy work there. And was it, had, had you, did you have that interest in medicine prior to your involvement uh, with climate activism or was that born out of your experience over the past few years? I've always wanted to be a doctor, which is very, very cliche, um, but working climate has shown me given me an idea even of where in medicine I want to go. So I specifically want to work in humanitarian medicine, um, being on the front line of natural disaster. Well, brilliant. That's very interesting. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, was it that school assignment that you had that first sort of sparked your interest in, in politics? Or did you sort of have any lingering interest in that uh, prior to that uh, assignment, which you mentioned? I think it was really that assignment. I like was well, relatively informed, um, as you can be for a nine-year-old. <laughs> but before that news assignment, I hadn't really given it much thought. So it was really that school assignment that catalyzed everything. Mm -hmm. And then what was it that um I guess if you if you did you you sort of started with that that emphasis on the political side of things, even though you your entryway really was uh, activism. I guess I'm curious to know why you um why you ended up steering more towards uh towards policy than activism or do you maybe see policy as its own form of of, act, of activism maybe you could speak about about that i think that's a really good question i do see policy as its own form of activism uh, especially in the uk right now so the right-wing party the conservatives have an enormous majority which means it's it basically impossible to pass any progressive legislation um, and putting any progressive legislation in parliament isn't so isn't to make it pass even though that's the ideal hope it's mm. more to put pressure on them to slightly shift their own policies forward mm. um because we know it won't pass it will get voted down but mm. because it exists and they can see there's both a public support for it and support from the opposition parties the mm. right um le leading party are being forced to kind of press a bit and push around mm. a bit and that is why they did implement some of the things in our bill um 
like introducing climate education into elementary schools. So I think it's activism in that sense. It's a more radical thing in this space and it's incredibly conservative. Um, and I think it's why I chose to go into more, more into policies because um, we are getting some more palatable or palpable wins from that. Uh, you mm -hmm. can see when a bill is put in place what it's achieving. With protest, it achieves so much, but I think it's more about public awareness and public support um, mm -hmm. rather than infrastructure change. And then when that's married together with policy work, you get not only the public support protests get, but government action too, because you're in there forcing them to act. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Well, that's about all we have time for now. What? Uh, so massive thank you from me, all the participants and the island of Bermuda. One last thing that I do want to make space for is for you to um, maybe share a bit about um, uh, what you'll be uh, presenting on when you are in, in Bermuda. So when I'm in Bermuda, I'm going to be talking about one of the initiatives we have at Teach the Future, the Teach the Teacher um, program, which is it's basically teaching students how to teach their teachers about climate change. So kind of flipping that on its head, um, as well as going more into depth about what we can do in terms of education in schools to tackle the climate crisis. Excellent. Thanks very much. That stirred a lot of ideas, especially within me. So if, if anyone, you know, is uh, still, still curious or has more questions, you are highly encouraged to attend the event. Thanks very much, Scarlett. Have a good rest Thank of your you. day. Great, excellent. Uh, so next, uh, we were due to have a presentation by Dr. Mark Richard from the Bermuda Weather Service. He is unable to attend due to unforeseen circumstances. However, we do have a video, um, a re recording of his presentation last year, which we will play for you. Um, this is very important because it gives us an idea of, uh, as we said today, the, our goal is to talk about the science of climate change, exactly what it is, on the impacts that it's having. So um, this will be a really informative video, especially for anyone who's in a position where they think that they, they do understand what climate change is conversationally, but maybe the mechanics of it uh, be, is, is sometimes lost on them. So uh, with that, um, right before uh, we get into that, first, we're going to have um, a, uh, a word cloud um, based on a, a Mentimeter. So um, if you look in your chat, you should see a prompt to, yep, uh, there is a prompt to that will take you uh, to a website, and there it says input the first word or two that comes to mind when you hear climate. So you can put a word in there, hit submit. You can submit more than one word, um, and these will generate a word cloud, uh, and it will give us an idea of where everyone is uh, is currently at. All right, so let's get a few more responses in. See, some people are posting in the chat, uh, posting their ideas in the chat, that's excellent. If you could also um, just click on the link, um, the in the chat, you'll see that there's a box that has a bunch of stars in a row that says word cloud. There's a link below that, below that um, and that will take you to the website so that your answers can you know, be brought into this uh, word cloud with, with everyone else's. So weather, environment, earth, climate change, global warming, rising to the, to the top of the list. And if for, if for any reason people are unable to, to use the link, it is okay if you post it in the chat because um, Noelle and I, we can enter your, um, your ideas. So yeah. We want everyone to participate. So don't not participate just because the link, if the link doesn't work for you. Great, excellent. So thank you for, for that, everyone. Um, we're now going to transition to the uh, recording from Dr. Mark Richard. 
Um, so this will tell us a little bit about uh, climate change and uh, exactly what it is and what's happening to our planet right now. Uh, good day, all. It's my very great pleasure to be uh, part of the first Bermuda Youth Climate Summit. And a big thank you to BREI and partners for arranging this event. My role today is to explain some of the science basis of climate change and really focus on what it means for Bermuda. So we'll run very quickly through this outline of discussion points specific to uh, definitions, some trends in the climate that we detect locally and project for the future. Uh, we'll talk about what that means for impacts in Bermuda, and then we'll wrap up our conversation today by asking the question, what can we all do about it? So I'd like to start out by posing a question that we as uh, meteorologists and climate scientists have heard uh, fairly frequently if uh, the weatherman can't get it right for the next uh, day or the next few days how can we know what's going to happen in uh, several decades from now so let's explore this a little via uh, a sort of a two question poll um, that we're going to have up on the screen uh, question one is do you think it will be colder in bermuda next february than it is now yes or no and then the second question is, will it rain in Bermuda on February 15th, 2022? Yes or no? And I'll pause while we get that up on the screen and uh, pull some of the answers from the audience. So as we can see from many of our responses, um, you indicate that it's going to be colder in February than now. So congratulations, you're all now scientists, and uh, we have made a climate prediction based on your knowledge of the seasons that the winter in Bermuda is colder than the autumn. Now, the answer to the second question is, I don't really know. I mean, that's a weather forecast, and as we've already said, we have a tough time, uh, tough enough time forecasting beyond several days. So the difference between the two is the degree of precision, and the, the sort of text here on the screen uh, outlines what um, I'm going to mention, and that is that you know climate is like the mean state of the atmosphere and and its surrounding systems that it interacts with. Uh, so we can talk about long-term averages and broad timescales, whereas weather is the minute-to-minute, day-to-day state of the the atmosphere. So hopefully we you can see that when we talk about climate you have a good sense that we're talking about average conditions, not what's happening in any given short period of time. So the climate, for example, for November 2021, where we're all at right now, has generally been cooler than um, and, and wetter than October, uh, whereas the weather today is what you see when you stick your head out of the window. Now we're going to disentangle a few other terms you may have heard. Uh, walking through this, um, if Earth didn't have an atmosphere, uh, apart from there being no air to breathe, it would be too cold to sustain us. And uh, an important part of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide and other gases. These uh, gases absorb and re-emit the sun's radiation. Here's a schematic of a carbon dioxide molecule here, absorbing the sun's rays as it, as it comes into the atmosphere and then sort of re-emitting re -emitting that uh, as, as heat. Um, and in effect, that uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere traps heat uh, like a blanket. This is just like if you go into a greenhouse on a cold day and the air inside is warmer due to the glass allowing most of the sun's rays in, but not all of the resulting heat to escape. So life on this planet is fortunate that we actually have this so-called greenhouse effect, which makes it warm enough to survive. And uh, again, here's that uh, sort of blanket of gases uh, trapping that heat around the, in the atmosphere, making the average temperature much more uh, habitable for, uh, for us here down at the surface. The challenge we now have is that we have more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere due to burning more and more fossil fuels since the Industrial Revolution. This is like throwing another blanket over us, allowing more and more heat to be trapped in the atmosphere. And the relationship between um, the amount of greenhouse gases like CO2 uh, in the air and the surface temperature is very tightly linked. It's very well documented. It's universally accepted in the scientific community as being certain. And the result is uh, global warming. You can see on this graph here that we've got an uptick since the, uh, the 1800s in both carbon dioxide and uh, surface temperature. 
So to sort of recap all of that and summarize it, we increase the amount of uh, greenhouse gases, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the air through more combustion. Uh, this enhances the greenhouse effect and leads to global warming, which is the driver for climate change. And climate change itself refers to a number of different uh, direct and indirect uh, consequences of that warming. Uh, we're not going to have time to address all of these today, but we will certainly focus on uh, some of these that have a great, uh, a potentially great impact on Bermuda. So do we see any of what I've just described in terms of greenhouse gases and their impacts on the, uh, the atmosphere and the ocean? Do we see those things locally? The answer is uh, most certainly yes. Uh, at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, the research conducted there has been uh, monitoring the gases in the atmosphere. Um, and you can see this, uh, this gradually rising uh, curve of carbon dioxide measured in the atmosphere uh, since the program began in the, in the 80s. And um, we're also seeing uh, changes in the chemistry and physics of the ocean for several decades. Um, as illustrated again in the schematic. So this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere gets, uh, some of it gets absorbed into the surface ocean and that, increase, that uh, increases the acidity or lowers the pH for anyone here studying chemistry of the upper ocean as excess carbon dioxide is, is absorbed by the waters in the upper ocean. So in addition, more than 90% of the excess heat produced by the additional uh, warming in the atmosphere has been absorbed by the ocean. So the near surface waters are also warming up and this has been tracked since the, the mid 1950s as well. Uh, there is this inexorable rise in surface temperature uh, near the upper part of the, um, the ocean. So all of these have been verified and measured by the scientists at BIOS and uh, similar trends are observed in other ocean basins around the world as well. One of the uh, alarming effects of this upper ocean warming is the effect on extreme events like hurricanes. Uh, we have just this year published a study that shows an upward trend in storm activity near Bermuda. And this is unsurprising as uh, ocean temperatures are the fuel for hurricanes to form and intensify. Um, and here we have uh, plots of tracks of hurricanes through the last 40 years in the 20th century and the first 20 years in, in this century, and we see there, there's uh, much more activity in the last 20 years. Um, and uh, we track that as uh, storms near Bermuda, not only are their frequency uh, increasing, but in addition, those storms that move near Bermuda are, uh, are sort of stronger in intensity as they pass by. Um, one uh, fairly alarming uh, situation is that we uh, assess that Hurricane Sam just last month was the strongest hurricane to get that close to Bermuda. And luckily it was a near miss, but it's uh, near its closest passage, it was nearly a category five storm, something that Bermuda has never experienced. Uh, so all of you in the audience, stage 13 to 22, have experienced more hurricanes affecting Bermuda in your lifetime than your parents will have by the time they were your age. Another strong signal that we see in the environmental data that we, we observe is that the sea level is rising and that rising is accelerating. The blue line here is the average annual sea level uh, measured by a tide gauge on the north side of St. George's and dating back to the 1930s, uh, a good 90 year record of extremely valuable data. What it shows is a slow but sure increase in the water level over time, something around two millimeters a year. And uh, of course that doesn't sound like much, but uh, as I mentioned, that, uh, that trend is accelerating over time. If we uh, use the latest uh, climate science projections of what the sea levels are going to be, again, at that site in Bermuda, on the north side of St. George's, uh, the red and the yellow and green curves on this chart, this, this sort of future part of the chart uh, for the next 50 years of sea level at that same site shows that that, that trend is speeding up, it's accelerating. Uh, these are based on, again, climate model projections that incorporate some of the things we've already talked about and also lots of complex physics like how and how fast glaciers are melting as well. Uh, so again, treat these as sort of average annual projections and the, the dashed lines here are sort of the, the variability about those, uh, about those uh, mean, mean projections. Treat them as sort of extreme events. 
So to put this sea level rise in context, um, and I've labeled each, each part of the, the chart here, um, the measured and the projected, uh, here we have a photo from King's Square in St. George's during a flooding event. And uh, now this is not uh, associated directly with climate change. This is an oceanographic feature that spins off the Gulf uh, Stream um, and uh, the Gulf Stream to our west and passes near Bermuda, especially during very high tides, incidentally, like we've just had in the last month or so. Uh, the point of showing this is that this is an extreme event and it may become more like uh, the norm uh, the average conditions in as little as 20 to 30 years time if these projections are um, are accurate. Um, in other words, by the time you're all my age, this may be the normal high tide. Uh, and without any further action, our UNESCO World Heritage Site in, in St. George's will be underwater more and more frequently. Today's extreme sea level events are projected to be within the normal tide range, possibly as soon as 20 years from now. So examining this in a uh, sort of a wider context, the good news is that not much of our properties around Bermuda are near sea level, or at least near enough to sea level to see that, that type of uh, flooding. Uh, but for those that are a meter or less above the sea level now, they will flood several hundred times more frequently than they do right now by 2050, uh, just 30 years time. Uh, here's some unpublished uh, work that we did uh, again at BIOS utilizing some government data sets, incorporating elevation and, and properties. Uh, and they incorporate both sea level rise and, and um, storm surge events. And you can see lots of properties are, are potentially at risk from uh, seawater flooding. So there are other things we should consider about the ocean that will likely cause problems. Just like the air, the ocean, ocean can suffer from heat waves. And these extreme heat events can cause the symbiotic algae that reside within all coral species uh, uh, to be expelled. And that's a natural reaction when they are stressed by a, uh, by a less habitable environment, um, uh, and especially when it gets too warm for them. In many cases, these expulsions of the algae may be long lasting or even permanent. So the algae is what gives the corals their vibrant color. So when they're expelled, it's called uh, coral bleaching. You may have heard of that term, coral bleaching. In a major bleaching event, uh, corals can in fact die and, uh, and ultimately be eroded over time. So we're at risk of uh, kind of losing some coral reef as a result of ocean warming. In addition, this uh, acidification of the surface ocean waters, so the, the gradually uh, lowering of the pH or the uh, acidifying of the upper ocean is gradually leading to more difficulty in some small plankton species um, and other species that grow structures that their shells are constructed from. Um, this, as well as impacts to coral habitats, can in turn have a knock-on effect on the food web that a myriad of species, including humans, depend upon. They say that every second breath of oxygen you take comes from the ocean. The, uh, the oxygen emitted by these, these small phytoplankton, the smallest plants in the world. Um, so by disrupting these food webs, we're actually interfering with our planet's life support system, and the very thing that uh, supports our food web. If economics and impacts to society is more where it hits home for you though, it's worth noting that Bermuda's coral reef contributes about $1 billion per year uh, to Bermuda's economy annually. And that's about one sixth of what our gross domestic, gross domestic product is, is valued at. And how is that that the coral reef can contribute? Well, it's through providing the sand for beaches, the fisheries on which we thrive, and the coastal protection against wave action from storms, which we've already heard are increasing in activity. Um, and of course, all of those things uh, help to provide uh, um, a, a vibrant economy that attracts tourists, attracts people to Bermuda. Um, it's also worth noting, of course, it's part of our identity. Our, our cultural identity is very much wrapped up in the, the beautiful uh, marine scenery that we have around Bermuda, going to the beach, uh, swimming, etc. So in summary, we have a number of different threats that have already started to become apparent locally, and some uh, interaction between those threats can make the assessment of the risk 
very, very complicated to understand. In this particular example, we see ocean warming giving rise to three different um, or, or exacerbating three different uh, effects, each of which can interact with one another to uh, lead to more uh, storm surge, uh, wave action and inundation risk at the coastline from seawater. This all sounds horrible. What do we do about it? What can we do about it? Well, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the some of the actions we can take. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about our own carbon footprint. So we have a very clever diagram here that outlines the quote unquote footprint of carbon emissions that we produce as humans. Each circle here represents, represents a, an individual country's uh, carbon emissions. Um, but uh, you know, by country through all of our activities. So this is an old chart dating about, about dating back about a decade or so, but it's still useful for illustrative purposes and the values remain relevant. So the large emitters on this graphic show the US in green here and China in orange here is the two biggest carbon producers. That hasn't changed in the last decade. And if we look at small islands uh, here in, in blue, for example, in our region and, and Bermuda in particular, we note that uh, we hardly produce any emissions at all. Um, uh, you can barely see the, uh, the dot here for Bermuda. Um, so as a country, uh, we're not emitting very much and contributing to the, the overall carbon budget on, on Earth. But if we take a look at how much per person each country emits, it paints a very different picture. What it tells us is that the average person in Bermuda emits more carbon than the average person in China. Uh, here's China. Here's the United States. So this is the amount of carbon emissions per person. And here's Bermuda. Um, so it's notable that small islands emit much more per person than you would think. Uh, so while mitigation of Bermuda's carbon footprint alone won't make a large impact on the global emissions budget or the impacts that Bermuda is going to face in the short term from climate change, carbon mitigation remains of critical importance. There's a lot we can do and must do individually, organizationally, and nationally. As global citizens, we should take seriously our individual responsibilities to mitigate the high individual carbon footprint that we each have. As a country of high per capita emissions and as one that faces serious consequences from climate change in action, we should be leading the charge to reduce our carbon footprint. And there's still very much hope that we can make a difference both through individual and collective actions. And you're going to be hearing some about some of the actions one can take uh, through the course of this summit. Um, here is what one ton of carbon dioxide looks like. I'm going to leave you with a thought here. Um, it's worth noting uh, that Bermuda, each Bermuda resident, emits on average per year about 10 tons of carbon dioxide uh, per year uh, through their daily activities. Um, and again, it's notable that small islands emit much more per person than you would think through their activities. So in summary, there are threats at the doorstep. We must adapt to become more resilient. We need to understand, acknowledge, and respond to these growing risks. In addition, we have a responsibility to mitigate our carbon footprint one of the highest per capita. And as residents of Earth, people in Bermuda must undertake more sustainable practices. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. So um, we, of course, won't be able to relay uh, your questions to uh, Dr. Mark Richard um, in, in this moment. However, we will forward them to him after the event. Um, and I think it is worth just going through uh, some of the questions just to see uh, what people are curious about. Um, so one of the questions is, what is the thing that Bermudians can do to help decrease the rate of climate change that will have the greatest impact? Um, I think that that's a great question. And ultimately, that's one of the, um, the overall um, goals of this summit and why we're bringing everyone together is, is to have that as a conversation, um, because it's it's a lot more difficult than just giving a, you know, a quick, concise answer. Um, Another question, is it possible for Bermuda um, or sorry, is it possible for Bermuda or most of it to end up underwater due to sea level rise? This um, in Dr. Gishard's absence, I do feel confident answering with my background as a um, as an earth scientist. Um, so the uh, sea level on Earth has fluctuated 
pretty significantly. There's about a, um, it's, it's debated in the literature, but about a 400 meter um, difference between maximum and, and minimum uh, fluctuations in sea level. Um, however, if we were to melt all the ice currently on Earth, um, the pr projections are that the sea level would go up about 70 meters, so that's 230 feet. Um, the maximum height of Bermuda is about 260 feet, um, like behind, uh, like Alton Hill, behind Zool, uh, the Zool's property. So, um, yeah, pretty much all of Bermuda would be underwater. And even the places that weren't would probably be inundated during storm surges. So it would not be an ideal um, situation if uh, we were to melt um, all of the um, all of the ice on Earth. Um, this would, Bermuda would certainly not be an ideal place to live if that were the case. Um Great. Um, and then a lot of comments about the, the feet. And um, uh, one last question. Uh, what tasks do we do we almost every day? What tasks do we do almost every day that emit carbon dioxide? Um, that's a great question, um, because I think a lot of us are thinking, well, what can I, you know, is there something I can do today? And likely there is. Uh, there's like the classic things that we always hear, right? Like turning off um, like lights if you're not in the room. But hopefully people are already doing that anyway. Um, so it is an interesting question, though, to think what are some daily steps we could take that we aren't already doing um, that could move us in the direction of uh, being able to reduce um, the amount of uh, CO2 uh, that we emit each year, especially seeing that image there at the end. I mean, I saw that last year, but again, it really um, it is somewhat jarring to think, well, I, I'm producing um, that much uh, just by living uh, in you know the isolated island of Bermuda. So. Um, yeah, we definitely have our, our work cut out for us, but working together, I'm sure that we can um, we can move in the direction that we need to. So um, excellent. So we're uh, moving a, a slightly uh, ahead of schedule, but that's all right. You know, flexibility is the, the name of the game. Um, right now, what we're going to have is we're going to have a, um, a video about plastics. Um, so we'll bring that up on the screen. So, um, you know, hop, hop into that right now. Plastic is everywhere, from plastic bags in the deepest parts of the ocean to microfibers high on the tallest mountains. Plastic has even found its way into the bodies of living creatures. Animals worldwide eat plastic without knowing it. Often, it kills them. And the global plastic problem is only getting worse. Despite the massive variety in our diets, most people are consuming about one credit card's worth of plastic every week. Um, from different sources in their diet. And that gets down into your gut, um, it can go into your liver, that may even have um, a role to play in the development of both obesity and diabetes. One of the biggest things to think about too is the impact that it has on fertility and future populations. Uh, a lot of these plastics are highly estrogenic and that has an impact on male fertility and on sperm counts and is actually affecting, well we're seeing that fertility levels are dropping and people are having a harder time uh, getting pregnant. Humans know that plastic is bad for us, why do we keep eating it? So we ask Zach Monis of Lindo's Grocery Store. If you want a pound of butter, it's already pre-wrapped for you. If you want a pound of hamburger, it's already pre-wrapped for you. At the end of the day, it was much cheaper to do stuff in plastic. So that's what the industries chose um, over the last probably 40 years. They started to do aluminum cans and the 20-ounce plastic bottles because it holds better, it ships better, it's not as heavy to ship. So when you bring in a container that is full of glass bottles and full of liquid on top of that, it costs more. We humans produce about 348 million tons of plastic a year and about half or 174 million tons is single-use plastic. Eric Hetzel and his family decided to go without using plastic and it was almost impossible. We stopped buying chips or any drinks in plastic, any uh, vegetables that came wrapped in plastic. We started bringing our own containers. After a couple of weeks, we kind of got into the hang of it. I mean, what happened to kind of call an end to our you know, little experiment was that we had some visitors that came and they immediately went out and bought about 10 pounds of plastic goods. Things like takeout containers, water bottles, plastic bags from stores, and other food packagings are the main reasons for single-use plastic. Each piece of plastic gets used for about 15 minutes, just long enough to eat what you just bought. 
and then it gets thrown away because we as consumers, we like convenience. But that convenience means that we produce 1 million plastic bags a minute worldwide. Of that million tons of plastic waste we humans generate every year, about 8 million tons of it gets dumped into the oceans. That's basically a truckload a minute. By 2025, some estimates say that we will have dumped 250 million tons of plastic into the ocean. And by 2050, the plastic in the ocean will outweigh the fish. Today, Bermuda generates about 19,000 tons of plastic per year, which is about 374 pounds per person. Since 1962, the Keep Bermuda Beautiful Foundation has been picking up trash that Bermuda residents have left on the ground. Katy Berry, the chairperson, says that KBB has seen a significant increase in plastic trash since KBB started. The majority of the litter on the roadsides is plastic. Once upon a time, when I was a kid, it would have been bottles and cans. And now it is almost entirely made up of plastic. And the majority of that is actually single-use plastic. Uh, the other piece that we're seeing is that the increase in waste um, coming from people's houses, that that is a majority of plastic. The amazing part is that 60 years ago, humans produced very little plastic. But since then, it has found its way into every part of our lives and our planet. Plastic is cheap, useful, and convenient. It makes life much easier. Every one of us is a consumer of plastic. Every one of us drives the problem, especially as individuals. Excellent, great. Welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, before the, our last uh, segment for today, we're going to have a pre presentation from last year's alumni. However, before that, um, just want to make sure that um, we're seeing how everyone is, uh, how, how the material that you've been uh, experiencing today is affecting you, the sort of ideas that are coming up. So here's a, uh, there's a Mentimeter in the, that's just been posted in the chat um, where you can uh, share some responses. Um, that you had to the uh, presentation by uh, Dr. Gashard. So let's go ahead and uh, have everyone um, follow that link. Um, and we'll try to keep the try to keep the answers short. Um, and yeah, we'll give you some give you some time. See again, some people are posting in the chat. Um, if possible, you know the the link is there, so just follow the link and you can put your responses there as well.
excellent. Looks like we're getting a lot of uh, a lot of responses. Definitely, people are alarmed by the uh, the quantities. I think really having some numbers to understand and contextualize uh, the amount of waste, whether it's uh, carbon emissions or uh, trash, um, is very useful in sort of grounding our understanding of uh, how how big of an issue this this really is. Uh, which um, is a good uh, transition to our next um, presentation. We're going to have the uh, an al alum from uh, last year's uh, climate summit, someone who focused on conservation. Um, and before, right before we get into that, we just want to talk a little bit about what conservation is. Um, I know that this word, um, it's a, you know, popular word, definitely since uh, when I was first growing up, um, it was already, you know, common in the literature and common in schools, people talked about conservation. Um, but we, we were interested um, in knowing sort of what that word means to you. So if you, um, we're going to, going to do one more um, Mentimeter before we have a presentation from our alum. So just click on that. Um, and it just gives us an opportunity for us to share, for you to share um, what that word conservation means to you. And there's no right or wrong answer for this. It's the, the whole point is that we want to know um, for each participant on a personal level what this, uh, what this word means. So um, yeah, come with all, all of your ideas. Keep this open for another minute. We got some really good responses coming in. So, if you haven't uh, already shared or spoken, please, please speak up, contribute. We want to hear what you have to say. Excellent, great. Thank you everyone for participating in that. Um, so it is important to acknowledge that while there are some common threads that uh, tie people's different understandings of conservation together, there are some acute differences and we want to make sure that we have a working definition of what conservation is uh, going throughout the rest of the summit. So um, on your screens now, um, there will be a slide that presents our uh, definition that we'll be using as a group. Conservation is the act of safekeeping existing resources for present and future generations. So some examples of this are protecting water quality, preserving green areas and nature reserves, um, such as the railway trail in Bermuda or Spittle Pond or the uh, recent effort to protect seagrass beds. Um, so with that, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Zara Trott. Uh, she uh, was part of the conservation group um, over the last year, having been inspired by her work uh, during the, the Youth Climate Summit of last year. Um, so please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Uh, Zara, lovely to have you here. We'd love to hear um, a little bit more about you, the school that you go to, and what made you uh, excited to participate in a conservation project over the last year. All right, hello. Um, thank you for the amazing introduction. I hope I can live up to it. Um, my name is Zara Trott and I am a 17-year-old student at the Barclay Institute. 
Um, as our lovely host introduced me, um, I am part of the conservation track here at YCS. And Zara, I'm curious to know how you first got involved with climate action. Was uh, was the Youth Climate Summit sort of your exposure uh, to this type of work, or was it something you were already curious about uh, prior to that? Um, I first started um, back like in primary school, to be completely honest. Um, the first experience that I can really remember was when I was about nine, and um, I was working with KBB, and um, we were cleaning up uh, around Victor Scott on this particular day. And it was absolutely raining the night before. So like we were able to get a lot of trash around then, but my trash bag in particular had ripped and all of the rainwater and the beer bottles and the trash all over me. I was wet the rest of the day not pleased about it. Um, if you've ever really been around KBB, especially if it's raining the night before, you might be able to kind of relate um, a bit to that. If you have, completely sorry about it because I could not get the smell it. I had to throw my entire outfit away, so. Oh dear, okay. yeah, I was uh, just down there the other day and remarking on the state of at the canal uh, running through there. I even uh, spoke with someone um, very recently. He was saying that when he grew up, um, there were eels like that it was, it was still, you know, the env environment there was so healthy enough to support like marine organisms would swim in from the ocean up the canal and live in there. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if they're still doing that, but I've, I've certainly in my lifetime never seen uh, anything like that. It's always been sort of um, an area that's, uh, that we have mistreated. So, um, but it is at the same time, cool to know these people like you have been, you know, for such a long time working to try to uh, correct things or, you know, shift the compass needle back and to a more positive direction. Um, so I think right now we're going to have, uh, we're gonna bring up a, a poll on Zoom um, just so that uh, we can sort of get, get a sense of um, the participants currently, uh, whether or not they're involved with any conservation action. So go ahead and really think to yourself, okay, is there any school group or any extracurricular group, maybe something you do with your family or your church group or um, some sort of community service that you think um, might qualify as conservation? We're calling that again, conservation is the act of safekeeping existing resources for present and future generations. So really think um, that that word resource, that word in itself is diverse. So if you're, um, if you're helping certain aspects of your community, cultural aspects, environmental aspects, if you're helping to ensure that those things are preserved for future generations, you are involved in a sort of uh, conservation effort. So it looks like we've got almost three quarters of people have responded. Let's see if we can get a little bit more participation. Great. So it seems that it's almost a, an even spread between people who um, believe that they are that they are involved, are not involved, or are not sure uh, whether or not uh, they are involved. So that's maybe something that we can um, work towards getting clarity on, Zara, because you had the opportunity to um, definitely to be involved over the last year with uh, some with uh, conservation actions. Could you share a little bit more about um, uh, what it was that you that you were doing over this over this past year? Um. So we did quite a lot throughout the past year, but the two experiences I most, um, that stayed in my memory the most, um, were our trips to one of two islands. Um, the first was our trip to Burt's Island. You might hear a few more alumni talk about that as everyone enjoyed it. We were able to partner with Water Start and go over to Burt's Island. Um, we met quite early in the morning and on our way there, we were all super hyped about it. And when we were able actually to get there, we were all over the place. We were taking tours, we were in the bushes, there were kayaks, we were swimming, we were snorkeling. The whole day was absolutely fun. I think everyone had an amazing time. Um, and I was able to get to know a lot more about Bird's Island, our island, as well as the people around me. I think it was an amazing time. And our second trip um, was to Trunk Island. We were able to meet at BAMS. 
And on our way there, we were actually able to stop and see some long tail nests, which you don't really see all that often. So that was definitely cool. Um, and when we actually were on island, we again took a tour. There was a lot more about plants and animals there than we actually expected. Um, and when we were actually able to start getting to work, there was sweat, there was soil, it was in our socks, in our hair, there were pickaxes and shovels, it was a lot of fun. Um, but by the end of our trip there, um, we were able to plant 29 native plants to Bermuda. That's awesome. Thank, well, th thank you. Thank you for those efforts. I'm curious, is that something that you could see becoming uh, a more popular uh, activity for students uh, to be to, to be a part of? I mean, of course, like when most people think of school, they think, you know, you're in your uniform, you're in your classroom, you're studying. Um, but I mean, you've had, uh, you know, this this opportunity to um, to, you know, to be outside, to be um, to be learning, to be with your classmates, but in this outdoor context, I'm curious. Um, is that something that you can see becoming more popular in Bermuda? Absolutely. Like no one likes being in a class the entire time. No one likes textbooks all that much. So hands-on learning and field trips have always been a fun thing for us to do, especially if you're like in a bad mood that particular day, just swinging a pickaxe at the ground. Definitely would recommend. Um, and on top of that, you're able to start saving our island in one of the most adventurous and fun ways you know like we were able to go to a bunch of exclusive places that not anyone can go to so I would definitely say you kind of feel like a VIP mm -hmm. so I can say that um, it would definitely become a lot more popular especially if you're interested in the subject yeah well I, I'm excited to hear that because I I um I always had challenges with formal education and being now an environmental educator myself I I can see how I would can be greatly beneficial uh, to learners. And it's something that I really hope uh, can, can take off in Bermuda as well. And it's cool that there are some organizations such as Water Start already doing it. Um, I'm curious as well, uh, who are some of the, pe the people or speakers from last year's uh, Youth Climate Summit who inspired you uh, over this, this last year? Oh gosh, um, it was an entire year long experience and there were so many presenters, especially in our first week. Mm -hmm. um, but I would have to say that the person who stuck up to me or stuck out to me the most during this year long project was definitely Wayne Keynes from Belco. He mm -hmm. was so passionate about how he spoke to us and all of his coming projects and future projects and everything that he was talking about, like there were questions firing back and forth the whole time. It was definitely um, one of the most passionate um talks that I've ever been to he's mm -hmm. very upbeat and fun and it just like it was really memorable to me so I would definitely have to say him mm -hmm. that's awesome and was that I mean it was that uh um could you share a little bit more about what it was like because you well you mentioned for example working with Water Start and going to Trunk Island but I don't I don't think that for all the other for the participants watching right now I'm not sure that they're um familiar with what you got to do with Belco. Would you be willing to share a little bit about that? Um, well, we mostly started off talking about presentations and their mm -hmm. new program. So they definitely have a lot going on. I know that they're planning to switch to completely renewable resources in the next 10 years or so. Um, and it was definitely interesting to see like an inside bird's eye view that you mm -hmm. can only get at Belco. Mm -hmm. um, to really like see that hands-on, it was definitely an amazing experience. And it was really informative to be completely honest. You know, mm -hmm. like doesn't entirely have a good rep. So mm -hmm. it was interesting to see how they planned on bouncing back. Yeah. Um, another question, uh, what is your uh, a favorite conservation tip or some, an idea that stuck out to you that you learned over the past year that you would like to pass on to this year's participants? Um, if you've ever heard your teacher kind of say like, check yourself before you wreck yourself, I know that's definitely one of my teacher's favorite sayings. Um, that's kind of what I would apply um, and my favorite conservation tip. It's more so making sure that you're okay and your ecosystem's all taken care of, your house, start with you to be completely honest. You know, you can't really save the world if you don't save yourself. So mm -hmm. I would definitely say start with you. 
Great. I, I especially uh, appreciate you saying that. I think that, um, that the importance of, you know, focusing on self and taking care of yourself for the sake of others, you know, and being able to help others is definitely uh, an underrated quality. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, we have a question coming in from someone, uh, one of the participants. They are curious to know, um, is there a conservation group at Berkeley or a group otherwise involved with, um, again, you know, preserving resources, social, cultural, environmental, um, or is this something that, um, uh, or otherwise uh, opportunities to get involved with this? So if someone's maybe watching this and thinking, hey, I, you know, I either want to start this at my school and maybe they're curious if, if, if Bark, so I, I said Berkeley, I'm used to thinking about the California school, um, Berkeley, sorry. Um, maybe they're curious to know what you have already at Berkeley going on. Um, or if, if not, if you've uh, heard of any other, uh, any other schools or after school programs or something, something for a way for students who are inspired by your presentation for them to, to get involved. Do you have any, any ideas for that? Um, well, to be completely honest, not really. That's something that we've kind of, you know, talked about. I know that I personally went to a talk with, um, one of our people here, Hannah, um, she actually came to our school and gave a short presentation about it. So um, if you're really curious, I would highly suggest, you know, like talking to our um, counselors there, going to our deputy principals. I know that like all of the schools that I've previously gone to, I've always kind of had like an ego club, but Barclay specifically mm -hmm. doesn't really have anything going on. So I know that last year we definitely talked about it with our other group sustainability here, um, which they have done a lot of amazing work over mm -hmm. there. Um, so I, I would say that it's in the works, but not completely there quite yet. So I would love to have something at Barclay. Yeah. yeah. And I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot or to make you feel like you have to speak for your entire school, but I am, if you're comfortable, I'm curious uh, just to know, um, based on like, I, 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 uh, never went to Barclay. I did have, uh, some good mates who went there, but so I don't have a, a very strong understanding of sort of the school culture and the, the different priorities like I know that so I, I was at work and like the big thing there seemed like sports like that was like a big thing for us I'm not uh too sure on like the different cultural emphases at uh Berkeley but I, I'd just be interested to know like from you personally what do you think based on the culture of your school the sort of interest that the students have currently the priorities of the teachers and the teaching staff what would be some, uh, like if you had, you know, like a, a magic wand or a million dollars, say, what would be some cool student groups that you could imagine um, uh, maybe creating, whether you would maybe take a leadership role in that, or even if, you, you know, even if we just keep it at the visionary level and just try to imagine what sort of uh, activities or community groups could you imagine uh, starting at your school? Well, I know that we always get told off for leaving trash around the place, and I know that mm everybody hates it so I can mm -hmm. definitely see some people being like okay let's get together let's clean up the school I don't feel like getting told off anymore assemblies you know I just feel like I'm getting yelled at mm -hmm. so I can definitely see a lot of people coming together and deciding to definitely clean up the school especially since we're really competitive with Cedar mm -hmm. Bridge mm -hmm. so that like if it was a competition we'd definitely be on that Barclay is a mm -hmm. very competitive school yeah um, academic wise sports wise just overall especially like within the school extremely competitive mm -hmm. so if we made it to a point where it was a competition I can definitely see things getting done yeah that's a good idea because you could also make that very quantitative right so you could weigh the trash and you could even account for differences um in like the school sizes by you know like dividing it by the number of people and you have okay per capita amount you can track it throughout the year and now, now, now you got my brain going too. That is actually, that is a really good idea. Um, is, has there been any, any sort of on like the official side, like from the, um, from the institution, from the Institute, has there been any effort to sort of legislate? I, I know that's sort of like a government word, but for lack of a better word to legislate, like introduce any school policies in order to address um, this, uh, this trash issue that you, that you brought up. Cause it sounds like it's a known issue. So it would strike me as something that um, people would maybe, you know, have have some sort of, um, and again, I don't want to put you on the spot and make you feel like you have to speak for your whole school, but I'm just I'm at, like wondering, you know, for you, you personally as a student and, you know, and a representative of your school. Um, well, that I can speak of as a alumni. I know that our sustainability group, which you'll hear from tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, has definitely tried to input like, there's usable um, lunch boxes at Barclay, actually. 
um, and a bunch of other schools, I think um, one of which was being Warwick Academy and a few others. Um, so I definitely know that there's something going on with that. I'm not sure about the progress of it, but I know that there has definitely been talk about it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, we're going to bring up our a second poll here. So this should be popping up on your screen, um, which is saying, do you think conservation action helps tackle climate change here in Bermuda? And based on these responses, uh, Zara and I can, um, we can talk, talk about that. Great, getting a lot of responses in. I'm, I'm seeing that people are becoming more uh, fluent in how this uh, platform works because the responses are coming in faster and faster. So that's great. Well, I'm glad I was able to initiate a conversation at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the over, overwhelming majority, 95% of people are saying that they do believe conservation uh, action helps tackle um, climate change here in Bermuda. Um, so perhaps we can, um, excellent. Uh, so perhaps we can bring up some of those uh, photos again that we had of, of the different activities that you were uh, participated in over this past year. Um, and we don't have to speak directly to what's happening in each of the photos, but I'm curious to know how um, your understanding of conservation has changed um, having gone through this program. So what are some sort of uh, ways that participating in conservation of the last year influenced your understanding of, you know, what it means or what, what it can potentially mean? Um, it was more so my perspective that changed, if anything. Mm. We've always kind of spoken about conservation and climate change, kind of like a doomsday event. Mm -hmm. And I was always scared that, you know, like the ice caps are going to melt, I'm going to drown, I'm going to die, you know, mm -hmm. that's kind of always how we've spoken about it. So now that I have this in-depth view of hands-on first, like from the horse's mouth knowledge, um, from all of these experts and amazing, wonderful people, I can definitely say that if we keep on track with what we're doing, we're not going to drown, we're not going to die. So that's a great thing. Um and, you know, like, I always kind of thought Bermuda as like an island, we weren't really too concerned with conservation. We were more concerned of, oh my gosh, the food prices are going up. Oh my gosh, the water's going up. I never really thought our focus was on the climate itself. So I'm definitely happy to report um, that we are focused on that. We're still planning on living somewhere um, and having a home. So that's also a great thing to personally know. It's definitely reassuring and it helps me personally sleep at night. I don't know about you, but it's mm -hmm. great to know that I have a home. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you for that. And one, just one final question. I'm curious to know from you how you think that um, sort of, I mean, we, we've heard a lot about the negative things that humans have done to our planet or that have taken place on our planet and the results um, or the sort of situation that's put us in and our need to address it. Um, but what we also need to think about, right, is um the sort of intended consequence or an anticipated benefits you could say of achieving conservation objectives if we if we are able to achieve the good things that we plan to do so i'm curious to know if you know assuming that all the different visions that that we're mentioning here in this conversation and throughout the summit if these come true what are some sort of um rays of hope that you see in bermuda what are some sort of um challenges that you can see us finding a way to work through um through taking steps toward things such as conservation? Definitely um, food security. I know that a lot of Bermudians are scared that we're gonna run out of food, especially because the, as I mentioned earlier, the food prices are going up. So I definitely believe that if we take an initiative to um, like make our own food and grow our own food, which our conservation, I mean, our, sorry, our climate justice track has definitely um, taken a part in. That's one of their objectives, which you'll hear from on Wednesday. Um, food scarcity and all of that has always been an issue, especially with my family um, and a lot of other families that I've known about. We're always scared about the um, prices of Bermuda. It's very expensive to live here. Mm -hmm. So I know that if we take a part in our climate, maybe like, um, for example, if, um, Sorry. If um, solar panels become a lot more cheaper or if we're able to get them in a more contained way of price, um, I know that a lot of people would definitely invest in that as well mm -hmm. as gardening and everything. So I think um, like we'd definitely be able 
to have a lot of positives and workarounds a lot about a lot of stuff. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you sort of bringing in like that you being willing to share about um, your you know personal experience with that challenge, because I think that that is um, something that really helps move move the dial forward is that a lot of the times when we hear about climate change and challenges, it's something that we can just like externalize or remove ourselves from. But it's important to remember that these are things that affect us and they don't, you know, they're not even affecting people. It's not just people, you know, it's like people, you know, you're, you're very neighbors, right? Uh, everyone around you um, is experiencing a lot of these challenges. So thank you, Zara. That's all we have time for right now. But I, I really appreciated this, this conversation. This was awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Great, uh, excellent. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Zara for, for that. I thought that was an, an excellent presentation. I was ex very excited to hear about the projects that she got to work on or, and the other members of the conservation group got to work on. Um, we're moving towards the end of our first day. So one thing that we would love for you all to do is just take a moment um, to just think about, to just reflect on the everything that you've learned today. So everything that's happened, I'm sure that there was a lot of anticipation coming up to this event, especially if, um, if you hadn't participated in last year's event. So please, we'd love to hear um, what this was like for you. You'll see a, a Mentimeter um, popping up. Uh, it's, in, it's in the chat right now. Um, so everyone go ahead and click on that and it will be, it'll take you to a website where the prompt reads, what is your takeaway from the first day? So again, these are going to be share, shared on the screen. So best to, you know, keep it short and sweet, but, you know, feel free to put some details into it. Like I love to see people you know, writing full sentences, someone saying climate change is really important and it's good to learn more about it. I completely agree. Um, so another another thing that really helps with these reflections is specificity um, because uh, yeah, that that that's going to be the difference between knowing what to include in a future sessions or what to take out. Um, we really want to know what are some specific moments. So maybe it was a quote from someone, maybe it was uh, a um, a, a graph or an image that was shared or something, something that really, um, you know, got you thinking, you know what, this is, this is important. And this is something that I, I can see myself being involved in. So just take another um, minute or two, just make sure that we, um, that we, yeah, we get some, uh, get some responses in. Oh, glad to see some people are getting a better understanding of what conservation is. People are mentioning that it's about, um, you know, making tiny adjust, like daily adjustments um, and sort of a amalgamation of a bunch of little changes is what can uh, make things, make things better, improve things. It is interesting to see that I'm, I'm pleased to see that a lot of people are saying that conservation was maybe something they weren't super clear on. And now having sat through this presentation, they are feeling a greater, uh, greater understanding of that. Great, and that's all we have for now. So um, thank you, that's only the first day. We have three more uh, virtual days where we'll be uh, tackling why we should care about climate change, what can we do, and future projections uh, for climate change. Once again, we would love to thank uh, all of our presenters. Um, we'd love to thank Scarlett Westbrook. Uh, we'd love to thank Dr. Mark Richard and uh, Zara Trott for everything that you've uh, contributed. And of course, we'd like to thank our uh, founding and visionary partners, AXA XL and HSBC. And looking ahead again to, and um, the rest of the partners listed on um, on the screen, and we're moving forward to, um, to looking forward to tomorrow, where we'll talk about uh, why we should care about climate change. Thank you all very much.